Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're, uh, we're uh, getting together again. We just finished a uh, meeting with the conservation planning and ZBA board, so thank you. Apologies for the wait. Could we start tonight with Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, everyone. Um, our first agenda item, now that we've gotten back together to reconvene, is a meeting with the Finance Committee and the School Committee. So I just want to check to see if both committees have a quorum. We do, Mr. Becker, and I will call the meeting on what the School Committee will vote on. Okay. Mr. Becker, will you call the meeting on the Great. Thanks very much. Um, I guess tonight, shall we start off with hearing from the School Committee? This is what it's all about tonight. Is or Doug is going to kick us off? Well, so uh, um, we have a couple of things that I wanted to cover. Um, first of all, the board met back in May, and we wanted to have uh, good communication with both the Finance Committee and School Committee. And one of those things that we suggested was have a uh, biannual meeting with uh, both boards. So we want to do one in the fall. Kind of got pushed off till uh, December now. Uh, and then we'll do one again later where we'll focus more on the budget. Um, but I think it's timely tonight that we talk about uh, the Warren article that will be proposed for the January town meeting, and that is to uh, borrow a million dollars for a feasibility study for the renovation of the high school. So that is um, uh, the first Warren article for the meeting. Uh, we've had a high school building committee that's been meeting uh, a few times. We have gone over the Warren article and the, the draft motion. Uh, we are all in agreement that it is kind of a lot of money when you think a million dollars just for a study, but that is what has been typically spent on the, the recent high school renovation projects around the state. Uh, so Dave, I don't know if you, you're also on the committee. Anything you want to add? So just um, for those that might be watching or are not familiar with the process, any city or town that is interested in renovating or building a new school, there's a process with the state where you apply you submit a statement of interest to the MSBA, the Massachusetts School Building Authority. We as a community have been doing that for at least five or six years. And fortunately, to, to ultimately, hopefully, uh, renovate Bartlett High School. And last year, we were initially accepted into the MSBA program. And then the MSBA will help communities fund school building projects. And so, for instance, the Park Ave project was roughly 75% funded of reimbursable expenses through the state. So it only cost the town 25% uh, of those reimbursable expenses. And once you enter into the MSBA process, there are numerous steps that you have to take. Uh, the first one, as Doug alluded to, is forming a school building committee, which we have done. It includes representatives, obviously, from the district leadership, building leadership, representatives of the school committee. Um, we have Doug and, and Tim are on the committee. We have Karen. So you want to make sure that you get a lot of people that would potentially have an interest. Uh, Mrs. Contos is the Board of Selectmen representative. And the first step in the MSBA process is to hopefully get approval locally for a feasibility study. And as Doug mentioned, we've had a couple meetings. The district leadership under Dr. Gogan and Mrs. Perangeli did a lot of research to estimate potentially what it would cost to conduct a feasibility study. And looking at similar projects around the state, we estimate that it could cost up to a million dollars. As Doug alluded to, that seems like an awful lot of money, and it is. But when you talk about the amount of information that the state is requiring us to go through as a school building committee, and also the due diligence that you're required to do, as well as when you get into public projects and you're talking about prevailing wages, the costs are, are much higher than what you might expect from a traditional uh, commercial, uh, commercial construction project. So the article that we will be presenting at town meeting will be hopefully uh, the town passing this million dollars for the feasibility study. If it gets approved by the town, we then submit that to the MSBA for their final approval. Assuming that the MSBA approves it, right now 
we estimate the reimbursement rate to still be around 75 percent, correct? You want to start? So for those that couldn't hear, it's right now 76.48, and they do reevaluate re for uh, January. So I'm not great with math, so it's easy for me to keep it roughly around 75 percent. So assuming that the MSBA approves the final project, then we obviously wouldn't move forward, even though the money would potentially would be allocated at the town meeting. Uh, we wouldn't move forward in, unless the MSBA approved it. We're looking at an estimated total cost of the town of $250,000 to complete the feasibility study. That is the first step that is required by the MSBA, and it is after the feasibility study is completed at that point, it takes a couple years to go through that process. It's at that point that the school building committee would come up with a recommendation of what they believe should occur. That, assuming it gets approved, goes to the school committee for approval, the board of selectmen for approval, and ultimately, it's again up to the town via both town meeting and a ballot question to approve any potential final project. But the feasibility study at this point would only be required on town meeting approval. So the, as you all know, the town meeting right now is scheduled for January 13th. Uh, we will have National Honor Society students who are offering babysitting services at 645, I assume in the lobby at Bartlett outside the auditorium. We also are planning an informational evening uh, on January 9th at six o'clock at Bartlett High School. Members of the district administration as well, uh, along with the school building committee will be in attendance and we'll have a presentation to give to anybody who wants more information or has any questions about the proposed project. And again, that's gonna be January 9th at six o'clock at Bartlett High School. So Dr. Gogan or Mrs. Perangeli, did I forget anything? Mr. Hurton, can I just make a comment through the chair? I, I believe we have until March 30th as the building committee to have this process completed with the MSBA. That's part of this phase, right? So just in case anyone's wondering why the timeline is the way it is, it's because of the constraints from the, from the, uh, the state in terms of how long we have to proceed. That's the reason for our for special, special yeah. town meeting. Yeah. For January. Yeah. Through the chair, we don't need a ballot vote on this part, just the town meeting? We don't, so if at a later time we want to exclude this as well as the entire project, we'd have to have a ballot vote at that time. I will add, uh, there needs to be significant expenditures done at the high school, whether we move forward with the renovation or not. So uh, from my perspective, I would much rather have the state pay 75% of uh, a lot of the cost than us bearing 100% of them. We are, and you are all probably aware of it, we already lost a boiler this year. And so the estimated cost is I think around $150,000 minimum to replace that. No, minimum most likely closer to 250. Right, yeah, for one of them, and we have another one, yeah. So it's obviously, it's a 40-year-old building, it's getting tired, and to Doug's point, we as a town are gonna have to deal with the building starting to uh, get very tired and fall apart. So hopefully, you know, people will support what we're trying to do, which is, to Doug's point, get the state to reimburse us 70, roughly 75% of the reimbursable expenses of any final project. So, Dave, the meeting on January 9th at 6 p.m. will be presenting, the, the uh, school committee will be presenting at least some dollars on what that total project might look like? No. Or, or are we gonna be talking about what the building needs to have done to it? Would you guys Just so like people are aware of what happens on, on January 9th. So it's actually, it's, a, it's an informational meeting sponsored by the school building committee, and it's going to be in conjunction with the district administration. And what we're gonna be presenting is, to your point, Mr. Becker, you know, why potentially does Bartlett need to be renovated, both from a building physical standpoint, as well as there's a lot of programming and educational uh, improvements that the district leadership would like to incorporate into a potential renovation project. But that informational meeting is just strictly to provide information about the article that's on the January 13th special town meeting, which is just the feasibility study. So it's, it ultimately obviously is all the same information, but just to clarify, we're only talking about the feasibility study portion of the project at this point. 
but at least people will have a better understanding about what needs to be done, whether it's HVAC, electrical, plumbing, what have you, roofs. Um, they'll have an idea of if we spend the million, you know, they're going to they're going to want to ask, or at least understand one what what are we going to get done? What does the building uh, have to have done to it? And maybe there'll be some estimate with regards to what the uh, the total cost will be. I know, I know that's a tough thing to put out there and like scare people, but. So, uh, so coming up, we're not going to be able to. The fee the meeting in January 9th is just to review um, what we're what the feasibility will do for the town. Mm -hmm. So the feasibility study, they're going to come out and they're going to take a look at the building and not just the building mechanics, but they take a look at programming. They take a look at future enrollment. They take a look at at everything that encompasses that building. That's what's going to happen during the feasibility okay. study. So that's what we're going for. It takes a look at process as a whole. On the ninth, we are looking for um, just to explain that to the community. We had to submit an SOI um, in order to get put on the list. And in that SOI, we talked about programming. We talked about things that needed to be repaired in the building. So th that's the kind of information that we can bring to the January 9th meeting for people who are not aware as to where we are in the process. And that, that was important, obviously, to get the MSBA to get us on this list. Absolutely. get us approved for this. And from okay. there to when we completed the SOI to now, things have, you know, what's deteriorated since then? Yeah. You know, like the loss of a boiler, what, what other things are happening in the building, where our roof's leaking, where are we seeing issues with our plumbing, like those kinds of things um, that we can bring to the table now that have changed just from when we submitted the SOI. Did you have a question? I was just wondering the uh, the building portion uh, and the program portion. Uh, does that have to be together to get the seventy five percent? I mean, you can't just do a building no, renovation and expect to get. No, because the um, what we put in the program that the state has put us into is the um, it, it's not the repair part of it. Yeah. It's renovation or build. So that's what they're going to assess. I mean, we're looking at a renovation. We're not looking to build a new high yeah. school. You yeah. know, we're no, looking no. at a renovation. Right. But it's not just for immediate repair. When you enter into that program, you, you get that one item, that they <coughs> like a roof or your windows. We had to put together a, um, an educational questionnaire to tie okay. in why we need um, a new space. So just to go back to the informational night, we will be providing the community members an update of the status of what Bartlett High School looks like and why um, the environment is impacting the learning. And so that's part of the plan, is to show people before we go to the town vote for the feasibility. The feasibility process itself will help us determine what the cost may be. They'll have a deeper dive look. They'll have experts come in and take a picture of what's going on. And but and Earl, just to answer your original question, th there is an accelerated program within the MSBA, as Mr. Pransley alluded to. For instance, if you were looking for just windows or you're looking just to replace the roof, you can enter into that. We, we opted for the full program because, A, there are so many physical needs of the building that it's not just limited to one major component, and B, uh, we do have some additional space where the district leadership has some really creative ideas on how we can expand what we're offering to our high school students beyond the traditional college preparedness pro program that we have now. And, and does this feasibility study also give you insight into the future operational costs uh, of such programs? You, you, that'll be a comprehensive yes. analysis. Yes. And all that information would ultimately be presented to the town mm -hmm. and ultimately a town meeting with a ballot question as part of what the final project. So as an example, when we were doing the Park Ave project, that w you raise a great point. Not only we, we, when we did the feasibility study did we know we needed millions of dollars to build a new school, what was going to be the increase in the operational expenses compared to the old school? And so we were able to get an estimate out of the feasibility study and I believe the estimate was relatively close once we opened up the building to what the additional operating costs that we would have to make sure we had funded in our operating budget. Yeah, and just if you're wondering, the, the program that we're entering into is called the core program through the MSBA. Through the chair, just to clarify the million dollars that uh, we're voting on, when you're saying the 75% reimbursed costing, 
So we are going to have to front the million dollars, though, and then submit for reimbursement. Are we going to have any financing costs with that? I mean, there are some, but the, even the financing costs are reimbursed at 75%. So. That was certainly <laughs> the, the biggest um, issue of the day between the, the two committees. Doug, do you have anything other specific items? Unless anyone else has any other questions. Uh, the yes. only other item I wanted to mention is uh, we're starting the FY21 budget process. Uh, the governor did pass a comprehensive education bill, uh, which we hope translates into more money for the Webster School Department. So uh, we'll we'll see in January if it. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Yeah. And it's the district leadership has already begun many months of meetings as they do every year, and I believe your first draft will be our second meeting in January. Yes, oh, the first, first meeting. meeting next, so our next meeting the meeting night after the special town meeting. The district leadership team will be presenting their first draft of our uh, of our budget. We're going to need to say keep our fingers crossed to get money from the state, but let's keep our fingers crossed that <laughs> we get more money from the state. For well, the, again, the, st the Student Opportunity Act did pass. It was passed by the legislature and it was signed by Governor Baker. It's estimated, I think, to be about 1.7 billion over seven years for the entire state. We still don't have a good sense locally um, what it's going to be, and. As, it sh as I think they, it, it was a good step that the state implemented, the district leadership team through the school committee is going to have to put together a plan of how we would utilize those additional funds. And that plan does need to be submitted to DESE, I believe, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, so that every school district around the state is going to have to say, this is what our needs are, and this is what we plan on doing with any additional money that we do receive. We don't know how much that is, but I think that's actually a very important step that the state implemented because we should all be accountable as, as communities. If they are going to give us more funding, how are we going to use that to improve both the education and what I call the educational environment within the district? We definitely are recognizing uh, what we as district have confronting costs. Uh, we've discussed transportation many times and the cost of out of district special education transportation. And that is one thing that's changed now. Um, it's going to be, we are going to be allowed to claim that on circuit breaker for increased revenue that year. So that's just one part of the Student Opportunity Act that we're looking at. So um, <coughs> I am hopeful, I am truly hopeful. But that's been a part we've been hurt by, so this should Absolutely. Help so out. I know that's on all of our radars. It's something we watch closely. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're recognizing. Um, you know, our low income, our ELL, our special education. These are things they're aware of and they've listened. So I'm hoping that turns into some significant um, reimbursement for us. And if I could, Mr. Chairman, I did say this at our meeting, but I do want to publicly thank uh, Representative McKenna and Senator Patman. I know they both have been strong advocates. It's been a, the, the state formed the Foundation Budget Refu Review Commission, I think five years ago, at least four, four or five years ago. <coughs> because the, the core formula that was being used to uh, provide state funding was based in 1993, and it hadn't really been adjusted. So the Foundation Budget Review Commission identified these core pockets that were not being properly funded, special ed, transportation, health insurance, and I forget the fourth. Second language learning. Second language learning, language learning. Language learning. thank you. And so finally, after a very long process, the legislature passed a bill that was signed by the governor. So those of us that have been watching closely have been waiting for a very long time for that to occur. Well, those sound like a number of areas that we could use the help in. So after a quarter of a century, it's good to hear them change it. Yes, right. Denise. Yeah, yes, Denise. And we will be putting together a plan that will be submitted for April 1st. Um, and those plans that we review, um, we have made some, um, I will publicly say that we've made some great gains in uh, trying to close the gap in some of those subgroups. And then, you know, I think we're a little bit ahead of uh, other districts in terms of some of the supports that we've already been able to put in place, and we will continue to do that as we can. Any further questions? No? Uh, hopefully that'll help our citizens better understand it and, and, you know, realize how important it is for our future, and, and especially with the town and 70% of our, our budget really going to take care of our children. It's extremely important. So, 
Thank you. Thank you. You want to go first? Adjourn. We adjourn. Uh, we'll actually reconvene downstairs. <laughs> I will entertain a motion to adjourn, adjourn the school Have committee fun. meeting. There's a motion and a second. Member Navarrata, Member McCara, Member Blight, yes. myself, yes, it's unanimous vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nico, do you want? Thank you. Thank you both. You. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Um, although our next meeting uh, item is the warrant, perhaps we can jump over that one if we could uh, and take the next two. We've got several folks meeting here. Um, so if we could uh, take our vote to appoint Robin Jewell to the Conservation Committee up right now. And Robin, if you want to come on up and you can introduce yourself. Doug, I think is. Yeah, well, Robin's coming up. I've met with Robin, and uh, she's a great candidate, as well as the conservation agent has met with her and has also recommended that Robin be appointed to the Conservation Commission. Great. Great. Robin, you want to let us, some of us know you, some of us might not. I was not. told I didn't have to be prepared, but I'll <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a lifelong member of Webster. I'm a lifelong member of Webster, and I mean lifelong as in birth of the regional. Uh, my, I lived on 288 Kildare with my mother, Jane Jewell, who still lives there, and I live six houses away. So uh, I uh, couldn't wait to get out of this town at 18, like a lot of us. Went to college, went to Boston College, uh, went to optometry school. In my early 30s, I found out this was the greatest place to be. Uh, and I'm on the lake, I have a home on the lake, and um, I actually don't know a lot about the con conservation laws, as I, I heard a little bit earlier, but if anyone knows me, I have a great ability to learn, and I have a natural love of the lake and of this community. So um, whatever I don't know as far as laws goes that we were all listening to a little earlier, I plan on hiring a, uh, what I did with my investments and I did with my accounting, I get a student. I'm going to get a law student and have him go over all the conservation laws. Then I don't have to pay $400 an hour to have an attorney do that with me, and a kid really likes that. So I'm going to learn the laws that come from the state, because we really do have to have, there's a balance. Um, you have an environment, but there are a lot, there's a happy medium, and I believe that we can all work together and find a ha you know, education that was said earlier. Uh, so people can build homes and change walls as long as they're educated first. So that's uh, well. It sounds like a great thing to have a tutor. Hey. <laughs> questions from the board? Nope. Yeah. Make a motion cool. to uh, appoint Robin Jewell to the conservation. Second. Second. Uh, any further questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 It is a unanimous vote. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very Congratulations. much. You will, Thank head, you. you will head next to our town clerk at some point. Yeah, we'll reach out to you, but you'll need to be sworn in with the town clerk, and then uh, we'll let the conservation agent let you know when their next meeting is. Okay, good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank Happy you. holidays to everybody. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. you too. Uh, just jumping back for a minute, the approval of the 11-18-2019 meeting minutes. Do we have any questions on those that were provided to us? <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the regular session meeting minutes. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's a unanimous vote. And the December 3rd meeting minutes? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Our next item on our agenda is uh, the TSKK liquor license violation. And I think we have representatives. Doug yeah, Lewis. so uh, we can have actually Deputy Chief Toby Wheeler come up and he'll uh, briefly overview the case and then we can um, uh, have the public hearing. Okay, okay. Or, 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 Do you want a motion to open the hearing? So actually, sorry, it's actually not a public hearing, okay. but to, to hear from the public. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So I believe you have in your packets a uh, report from Sergeant Perry. Um, I have the uh, bullet points from that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like me to go over that. Please. 
so this involves a TSKK club uh, at 21 Harris Street, Webster, Mass. Uh, the incident in question occurred on November 16, 2019. The incident time, uh, which was the first time we received a phone call on it, was 10.17 p.m. <coughs> Uh, the incident is classified as a fight in assault and battery with dangerous weapon. Uh, the weapon in question was a knife. It relates to Webster PD report 19-web-29963-AR. At approximately 1017 p.m., the Webster Police Department was informed of this incident by Harrington Healthcare and Hubbard Hospital emergency room staff. The information relayed to the Webster Police Department by emergency room staff came from a male patient identified as Mark McClellan and from the girlfriend of Mr. McClellan, identified as Chantel Ouellette. Sergeant Perry and also Michael Reardon responded and conducted an investigation. Upon speaking with Mr. McClellan and Ms. Ouellette, officers were told that Mr. McClellan was picked up by Ms. Ouellette at the TSKK and subsequently driven to the hospital after Mr. McClellan was involved in a fight at the TSKK. At the hospital, officers were informed of the name of the other person involved in the fight that person was identified as Jose Delgado. Officers also learned Mr. Ouellette witnessed, excuse me, Ms. Ouellette witnessed uh, Mr. McClellan getting punched. Officers responded to TSKK and continued their investigation. At the TSKK, officers spoke with Mr. Delgado, who reported he knew Mr. McClellan and that Mr. McClellan was intoxicated. Mr. Delgado also stated that Mr. McClellan had engaged Ms. Ouellette in a verbal argument over Ms. Ouellette backing into a parked car when Ms. Ouellette arrived to pick up Mr. McClellan at the TSKK. Mr. Delgado told officers he escorted Mr. McClellan outside along with the TSKK bouncer identified as Mr. Thomas Courtney. Mr. Delgado told officers that upon escorting Mr. McClellan outside, Mr. McClellan pulled away and pulled out a knife waving it around. Mr. Delgado told officers that while the knife was being waved around by Mr. McClellan, Mr. Delgado received a small laceration to his finger from the knife. Based upon all statements gathered, it was around this time Mr. McClellan was punched by Mr. Delgado when Mr. McClellan moved towards Mr. Delgado and Mr. Courtney with the knife. Evidence gathered showed that upon being punched, Mr. McClellan fell to the ground where his head impacted the pavement. After speaking with Mr. Delgado, officers then spoke with the TSKK bouncer, Thomas Courtney. Mr. Courtney was less than forthcoming. Ultimately, Mr. Courtney did tell officers Mr. McClellan was struck by Mr. Delgado after Mr. McClellan pulled out a knife. Officers continued their investigation, which now entailed attempting to locate the knife in question. Officers were unable to locate a knife in Mr. McClellan's property at the hospital. Officers returned to TSKK and again spoke with Mr. Courtney, the TSKK bouncer. Mr. Courtney then turned over the alleged knife in question, which was retrieved from inside TSKK. This knife could have been and should have been immediately turned over to the police during the first interaction with Mr. Courtney. This incident could have been and should have been reported to the police by the TSKK employees either before, during, or after the reported fight which involved the knife. Officers did work with the TSKK bar manager, Mark Costin, to obtain video surveillance footage of this incident which supports the aforementioned details. Mr. Costin was fully compliant with this investigation and did express remorse for the incident that occurred. So basically it boils down to two um, allegations against TSKK, um, the major of which being uh, not calling us during, uh, before or after the altercation, the fight that took place in their parking lot, and then subsequently the uh, refusal initially of their employee to cooperate with our investigation and his subsequent um, obstructing justice by taking evidence off of the ground, which in this case was the alleged knife, and then bringing it inside TSKK and not initially turning it over to us um, until he was prompted um, to do so. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Any questions from board members for Deputy Chief? Uh, to the chair, uh, w was there any question of over-serving at any time? Um, so in, in our world of uh, probable cause, we don't have sufficient probable cause to uh, state that. Um, in the report that you have, uh, Mr. McClellan, if my memory serves, indicated having roughly six beers before, before going to TSKK and stated that he had two drinks uh, while at TSKK. Um, I don't know if we have that portion of video to support that in, or not. Clearly the um, behavior subsequent to that indicates there's some sort of altered mental state from alcohol presumably, um, but we don't have sufficient probable cause to 
uh, state that he's overserved. And second question is, um, have you had reason in the past six months to uh, uh, address fighting out in the parking lot uh, at PSKK? Has the, has the police been called? I am not aware of any previous incidents within the last six months at PSKK. Okay. But there could be that you might not be aware of, is that fair to say? I, I think given the nature of the neighborhood being somewhat close-knit, you know, Obviously, someone didn't call when this fight occurred, but generally, if things occur in that area, we are we are called. Um, but again, I'm not aware of anything that did occur. Okay, thank you. Uh, if board members have any other questions, we will, I think, ask to have PSKK representatives, uh, and maybe their attorney, come up next, if you could, please, if you wish to. So just um, so you're aware, so we've received the letter uh, December 6th indicating three violations, one of which uh, Deputy Chief Wheeler may, you know, the, the service of an alcohol to an intoxicated person may be, is it fair to say that one might be somewhere up in the air serving? Okay. Um, so you've seen this letter and we've also been provided, the board has been provided the police report, so we've all gotten a chance to read the police report. So leave the floor to you. And if you can introduce yourselves, please. Okay. My name is Mike Kaskopoulos, and I'm the president of the PSKK. Mark Hoskin, bar manager. All right, so um, you got the three violations. The first one, permitting a disorder disturbance. Yeah, you can just pull the microphone towards oh. you if you could. That'd be great. Thank you. Permitting a disorder disturbance or illegality to take place on the licensed premises. Well, um, we don't, obviously, we don't permit anything like that to happen. And the employee that was um, at the door was fired immediately after I was told what had happened. He was acted out of, <coughs> um, what I'm looking for, out of order. Was, I mean, anytime any disturbance happens at PSKK or anything, which we don't usually get these types of instances, but um, number one is call for help, you know. So as soon as I, um, Officer Perry called me up on Sunday to let me know what was going on, that man was immediately fired. I mean, there was no questions had to be asked of him because he did not follow protocol for how we run our establishment. Um, and that also probably goes into number three on the list over there too, because um, we're always forthcoming. You know, in the past we've even helped out the police with other investigations. They needed our cameras or whatever. We're always right there to cooperate. <coughs> and um, serving of alcohol to an intoxicated person, all I can say is um, uh, the bartender on duty was is a bartender of 20 years experience. She's been tip certified over and over again. And when I talked to her, she said he came in, he was quiet, he had like the two drinks or whatever it was, and um, she noticed no visible slurring or didn't seem intoxicated whatsoever. She's seen him in there before and he's, you know, but she said he was talking a little excessively, which sort of made her wonder, you know, after the second drink that, oh. But, um, what had prompted him to be escorted out was when he's gone to the bathroom, I guess he had, there was a DJ in there and he was meddling with his equipment. So then that's when they wanted him to leave and that's when the trouble started outside. I, you've answered one of the, the, several of the questions, you know, was the bartender tip certified? How long were they tip certified? Uh, did he so show any signs of intoxication? How long, do you have a, a a form or a book where a member has to sign in and then you note yes, the time they sign in? Yeah. Do you know approximately that. how long Mr. McClellan was in the There's no time on our, on our signing sheet. It's just your name and your town. And, and does the bartender recall or, or she said the she police said he recall? was there approximately two hours. Two hours. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the board? 
I just had one. You had mentioned protocols for running the establishment. Mm. So um, in the case of this particular employee, what do you do to train your employees so they understand what the expectations are in these situations? Because yeah, um, in, in this case, it right, seems that yeah. it failed, and, and why did that fail? It did. Um, well, we've never had that situation before. And, um, but as far as um, when interviewing the person, you know, ask if he had any experience, he had prior experience working doors, his parents owned a, um, an establishment in Worcester, and, and that was his um, experience. And what we tell them, all, all his job was to do is to check IDs to help, because on a weekend, on a Saturday night, they have a, um, a karaoke night. And um, we just wanna make sure that everyone in there is coming in as sober, and is of age and has their ID on them and they're signing the book and that was his job to do that. And the other part of his job basically was just to make sure that people, you know, have to go outside and smoke cigarettes and stuff. And to make sure no one's smoking on the stairs and no one's doing any other illegal activities out there, you know, to make it comfortable for the patrons that do come in. And and that's it. And so since this occurred what has been done to educate the rest of the employees about expectations moving forward? I've had a meeting with all the bartenders and I had to hire a new, a, a new person to watch our door for us and just, you know, strict, you know, everything's actually written down. I didn't bring that paper with um, procedures. The procedures. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, to the chair, is the person who's watching the door also responsible for what happens in the parking lot? Well, responsible, all he should be, if you see something go on out there, what they're instructed to do is either let the bartender know immediately or, or dial 911, period. So whatever happened in the parking lot that night, no one knew until Correct. at least you know, August it's like, the um, next day. I was, in, um, I, got, I was out of town and I had gotten a phone call. I guess the cops had already, the cops had already left. I was sleeping, you know, and um, when I went, so I was out of town, and the, the police officer called me actually the next day, it was a football game, and um, explained everything that happened to me over the phone, when, when that's when I immediately took action. Any further questions? Deputy Chief, Lula? Yeah, uh, you can clarify your point, I just want to understand. If, if you wouldn't mind, you can, you can probably grab a seat right here if you could, thank you. Just to clarify that point, uh, the bouncer doorman was part of the altercation in the parking lot. Right. Uh, so he was aware of what was transpired outside. Right. And based upon Sergeant Perry's um, report, <laughs> uh, there were several other people outside. You know, so one could reasonably conclude the bartender knew what was going on as well. Um, yeah, so yeah. This is possibly the other way to say, but the people in the parking lot said that he knew that. So uh, to the yeah, chair. The <coughs> that, I, that leads me. Who was the manager on that night then? Well, the, um, whenever, whenever um, the bartender is always the manager on duty. Um, there's only one manager of the bar, which is me, and I'm not there 24/7. Okay, so yeah. if, so I I guess my my question is is that if the bartender, I mean the doorman, is involved with what's going on outside, and the the bartender is sort of the quasi manager who's on because they, she, she or he can see the door and what's going on. Right. Why didn't that person recall 911? Um, actually she was, our, our bartenders were told that if there's any type of thing going on, she needed to know that she stay behind the bar. And when she did go out, the door person told her everything's, all, everything's okay. And she went back in. And then that's when people were talking and before, I guess, that's when the police came in shortly after. She had stated if she had known exactly what happened out there, she would have called for help immediately. And, and remind me, please, um, I couldn't, can't remember in the report, who was it that called the police? It was the uh, staff that called the police. Mm. Usually the administrator would call the police. So the bartender never <coughs> attempted to call, even though the bartender knew something was going on, the bartender assumed yeah, she everything had been exactly taken care of? Yeah, she knew exactly what was going on. The, the door person should have alerted her, and one of them should have called. You know, it, it, it seemed Media clear through reading the report that Mr. Courtney, you know, he was an employee, uh, he knew the procedures, he didn't follow the procedures, 
Um, and then it seemed as though through the interviews that Sergeant Perry had, um, he certainly seemed to me through reading that report to be hindering the investigation, including you know hiding uh, the knife, the purported uh, weapon. Um, so the hindering the investigation, um, in my opinion, we'll, we'll, we'll talk uh, more, but in my opinion, that seems appropriate. Uh, one of the things that I'm questioning, I'm not sure, Mr. Klassen, I, I appreciate everything you've done, and I know that the TSKK has been run very, very well, <coughs> um, and it's unfortunate that you weren't notified, and I would agree you would never permit you know, a, distorted, a disorder or a disturbance, and I'm not sure, um, and maybe uh, Deputy Chief Wheeler, maybe you can describe that particular violation, um, if you could, permitting a disorder, um, because I think the second item here, the serving of alcohol to an intoxicated person, we all know from past experiences and, and past hearings like this, it's difficult unless the person was in the bar the entire time, you know, hours and hours on end. Right. It's difficult uh, to find a violation. But can you describe a little more, um, you know, what violation of permitting a disorder, disturbance, or illegality could take place on a licensed premises? So similar to other violations we've had in the past, um, as you stated, it's very difficult to provide the, the level of proof when someone's been disturbed without some sort of uh, data. In, in, in some cases, we use a corporal breath test or other, other devices. So that, that makes it more difficult. We could you know, say it's more likely than not in this case, but we don't know that. What we do know is the <coughs> incident that occurred in the parking lot. Um, bars have been the establishments that are responsible for more than their interior. They're in charge of the exterior of the property that they own. Uh, in this instance, um, there was a fight involved. There was two cases um, going at it. One case, he pulled out a knife. Um, the, the bouncer was you know, attempting to do his job and probably being found ultimately failed because he tried to you know, cover the matters up and you know, stonewall the investigation. Um, so disorderly conduct, you know, we created the you know, uh, uh, hazardous environment you know, with patrons could have been hurt. Clearly two people in this instance did get hurt. Um, in this regard, now to defend himself, he struck Mr. McClellan. Mr. McClellan fell to the ground and struck his head. This was the initial phone call that the police recovered. Um, there were several persons out and about in the area. TSKK4, um, but you know, luckily we found out about it after the fact and were able to, you know, A, get the weapon involved and secure that, and, and B, you know, uh, bring this to Mr. Fox's attention or Mr. Barr's attention so that he corrected it on that day. So is it fair that first violation permitting a disorder kind of goes hand in hand with the hindering the investigation? Is that <coughs> because uh, of our, the, the bouncer, as we called it, Mr. Courtney, was involved in that? Yes, so there are charges for coming for obstruction of justice. Uh, Sergeant Perry will be applying those charges shortly. Um, you know, just the mere fact of omitting and delaying our investigation and, and hindering us as far as uh, being forthcoming and, and omitting certain facts, we did call them. Uh, but the tipping point that we decided to you know, apply charges after the fact was actually taking evidence of an assault where they knife off the ground, taking it inside the establishment motorcycle group that is uh, known to be somewhat anti-law enforcement, uh, and that relationship hindered him, you know, being forthcoming initially with this investigation. And I think we all read that mm -hmm. uh, in, in your report, so it's good to at least understand that. <coughs> uh, further questions? I'd just like to ask, uh, I, I know you have a very active club, um, and you run a lot of functions. Uh, do you always have a bouncer? No, um, actually it's 
Because there is a lot of activity there. Yeah, I mean, I think you'll agree. It's very good for you. I mean, you do yeah, a lot um, of events, but. We, when, when there's an event, we just started this actually um, because of um, just to be proactive, you know, we never had a person at the door before. Um, we had one, one, maybe about three months this was going on. And you had one what? Uh, it, no, with, uh, we had a different doorman oh, previous okay. to this guy. This guy was only here a couple of weeks, and um, he had to quit for another job. But it just was something recent that we started. About three, I say about three months. We started to have a doorman, there. and that's only on certain on only when function there's, nights when there's, when there's people, you know, function yeah. nights when there's a karaoke. Because I, I I do know that there was a, a case uh, involving a motorcycle patrolman coming in to a, quite a disturbance a few months back. I don't know if you recall that. Was these are, might have been more than successful, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, it was over the summer, but but uh, it, it was quite another quite uh, intense, and I think there was knives and, and weapons. Correct. Uh, so this isn't the first isolated. No, that had nothing to do with us, I have to answer Well, it occurred that. in your it, it parking lot. It occurred in the lot. street. No, I, I live across the street. It occurred in the parking lot. Yeah, on the sidewalk area, yeah. yeah. But we didn't. We, uh, I'm not trying to argue yeah, with you on the point, but that was a little different than this particular one. Uh, the point I'm trying to make, though, is is that you do have a lot of activity. Right. You have an active parking lot, so I think it is important to have well-trained door people uh, knowing what to do in these instances. Um, question for <coughs> Deputy Chief Wheeler or Doug or Courtney. Um, have we had or have we been made aware of, or has the town been made, been made aware of any issues in the past with uh, TSK other than the one that? Yeah, we didn't have any inside? liquor uh, violations in the past. Uh, have not. Yeah. Any further questions from the board, um, Mr. Costner? Any? If, if I may. Um, so I I agree with the officer in his description. Deputy of Chief. I'm sorry, Deputy Chief. My apologies um, was his investigation was a knife incident hindered by an individual according to the report we can't really argue the point but as far as the TSKK is an entity we would no way shape or form condone that kind of uh, partic you know a cooperation with law enforcement we've always we've asked law enforcement in Webster for advice on certain matters and how we should handle them. We've cooperated in other investigations with them. Um, we welcome law enforcement to help us when we need help and we support them every way we can. And we, we would never condone the actions taken by that <coughs> individual um, as an entity. Um, so, you know, I can only say that that, would, that, that would be, that's not what we stand for. We like to be a friendly, family-oriented establishment and club. We're a club. Um, we have a membership. They vote. We elected officials, myself, we get voted on. Um, we have children's Christmas party. We support all kinds of uh, softball, little league, bowling leagues, uh, all kinds of different things in the community. Uh, we donate where we can. Boys and Girls Club. Boys and Girls Club, um, things like that. And, um, that person that hindered your investigation um, was summarily dismissed immediately. Like it was not, I don't even think 24 hours went by. So, um, you know, for that we can only apologize, but we don't condone that kind of action, and nor will we in the future. And we've made, we've, we've had meetings on it, and we're really moving forward to make sure that doesn't happen again. <coughs> um, I know that people have been calling it a bouncer. When we yeah, door man, a door man is but when we established the position, we took great pains not to say that this is a bouncer. This isn't a dive bar where we have fights every Saturday and we need somebody to control a big ruckus. The, the doorman asked the person to leave, that person left. He then got mad at his girlfriend for hitting a car and then everything ensued after that. But nothing started in the bar other than he was asked to leave and he did so. So, and that's, that's protocol. Please leave, okay, and, there, and if there's no incident. And again, 
can't say how sorry we are that the police weren't called immediately. We were not trying to hide anything. And as you saw in the report, the minute we found out, here's our films, we have cameras everywhere. And the cameras actually help support, um, you know, some of the allegations, I'm sure, on the individuals involved. No, I think it comes across in the report in the dealings that Sergeant Perry had uh, with Mr. Costin that you know, he's been, he is very forthright in, you know, I thank Mr. Costin for, for being that way. It's unfortunate that um, this incident happened with an employee of yours at the time. Right. So I think um, it, you know, the advice that uh, Deputy Chief Wheeler was saying is that, um, you know, obviously be careful who you hire and, and do appropriate background well, we've checks. We've taken it and we've taken steps towards that too. Anybody that works in the bar for the bar is now going to be tips trained and there is a very specific sheet of instructions that we have. Um, and you know, probably number one on the list is if there's an issue, we have a panic button which we just call our alarm company and we had them make sure that it works. And we've got everything that we can do to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again or that the police aren't involved as soon as humanly possible if need be. That's all I got to say. Any more from? I support what Mr. Dunn was saying, the intent of the message. Um, and, and when I read your views over the event, you know, may not be to be fair to see it this way. I, I just want to be on the, the, the process of towards your client and be remorseful. And our partnership is such that uh, Mr. Costin was unable to uh, run his own video equipment. So Detective Reed, who had experience doing it before, was able to do it with him uh, for the past cooperation. No. Anyone? Okay. Um, I think at this point, uh, entertain some motions if, if that's the sure. desire of the board. Yeah, I'll make a motion to just issue a verbal warning. I think based upon what the deputy chief has told us about how the TSK K as an entity has cooperated fully with law enforcement, the individual responsible for the actions on the night of has been terminated. I could see voting differently if TSKK, the entity had said, you know what, we have no problem with this individual still being hired and working here. If that was their position, I'd be a lot more concerned, but the fact that they terminated the individual shows to their credit that they want to move forward. Second, second that motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, and I would just, uh, out of discussion, I would ask either Courtney or Doug, do we need to state, should we state, uh, the reason for the verbal warning without without a policy should we be stating uh, we should say which one of the violations uh, so I don't know if, um, Mr. Joel if you want to amend sure I, I didn't mean it too um, or, or yeah I would be hindering an investigation under that one okay. item number three violation MG MGL chapter 138 63a hindering investigation so I have a second second okay. any further discussion Courtney, would you call, uh, pull the board, please? Selectman Gabor? Yes. Selectman Tontos? Yes. Selectman Dolan? Yes. Selectman Borch? Yes. Chairman Becker? Yes. And again, thank you, Mr. Costin, uh, for being forthright. Uh, Deputy Chief Wheeler, Sergeant Perry, thank you, and the rest of the officers involved. It was handled very well. And thankfully, something tragic didn't happen. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much. We'll see you again. Happy holidays. Indeed. Happy holidays, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if possible, can we do the warrant now? The uh, the planning board is waiting to hold that the public would be hearing. Nice, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry for the plane. Are they here? No, they're in somewhere else. All right. 
So I will uh, briefly review the Warren articles and their draft form, and then maybe once we reviewed them all, uh, you can ask questions and uh, we can take a vote after that. So Article 1 is to appropriate the million dollars for the high school renovation feasibility, feasibility study. Articles 2 through uh, 12, those are the articles that uh, were originally voted and approved at the December 2018 special town meeting. Uh, that was not posted correctly, so those have been re, uh, resubmitted so that they can be voted on again. So Article 2 is a uh, prior year bill from 2019, uh, fiscal year 19. Uh, Article 3 is a transfer for the Town Hall uh, Improvement Fund. Article 3 is the funding of debt pay downs through a, uh, the balance of a, the landfill compost uh, account. Article 4 is to impose a 3% marijuana tax. Article 4 is and to re- Doug, just so you know, our listing here, that would be Article 5 for the marijuana tax. Oh, so, yes, sorry. It is 5, yeah. <laughs> Article 6 is to rezone 30 Worcester Road to industrial, from, from business to industrial. Article 7 is to create uh, marijuana research facilities by special permit in uh, the industrial areas. Uh, Article 8 is to update the zoning bylaw to allow marijuana research facilities. Article Again, just in ours, it's Article 9, just so people know what we have. Article 9. Yeah, all right, so we're in now Article 9, sorry if I'm saying I'm wrong, uh, is to allow for retail marijuana zoning bylaw. Uh, this uh, allows it in the, the districts at the... Uh, Kmart Shopping Plaza and also up on Town Forest Road and those are done by special permit. So to Article 10 that is updating the zoning table to include recreational marijuana uh, retail sales as a special permit. Uh, Article 11 is to uh, allow 20% of our uh, alcoholic beverages uh, uh, licensed, uh, sorry, <laughs> licensed places to serve alcoholic beverages uh, to allow that many marijuana retail facilities. So that would be two. Twenty percent of licensed establishments. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> and so that gets us two. Mouthful. <laughs> uh, and then Article Twelve is the temporary repair of private ways. Article 13 is a new article. This would allow the, the Board of Selectmen to petition the state legislature for authorizing improvements on those public ways to be, uh, to go up to and including resurfacing and paving uh, private ways. Article 14 is, uh, was passed over at our last town meeting. So this is a paving of the portion of Loveland Road from number 23 to 37. Article 15 is an appropriation to do that. Article 16 is the removal of the Webster Police Department from the civil service. Uh, Article 17 is to pay for a general fund prior year bill. And Article 18 is an appropriation from the Town Hall Stabilization to the Town Hall Improvement Fund. And Article 19 is to adopt uh, Chapter 90, Section 17C, which will allow the Board of Selectmen to designate certain areas as a 25 mile per hour uh, speed limit. So uh, I know that was a little rush. Are there certain articles that you want to uh, go into more? Doug, did you say Article 1 and Article 13 are new? The rest so, were so articles 12 through 13 two, are or two, 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 two. Sorry. two through 12. You said were from Previously. December of 2018. Yeah, yeah. through 13. So 13 th isn't new. No, 13, 13 is new. Is new. Okay, is new. that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. Can you uh, just Can you explain that? A little detail? Yeah. yeah. So article 12 allows the improvement of private ways, and uh, there's major and temporary repairs to private ways. Uh, the state law is, uh, doesn't specifically say that you can resurface as a temporary repair. So to clarify that, uh, we are petitioning the 
state to allow resurfacing as a, a temporary repair. So this was suggested by town council. It was, yeah. Doug, the, uh, the last item, Article 19, um, takes care of the issue that Earl had raised at our last meeting with regards to the speed limit. Right, yeah. Y you would think it's easy to put up a speed limit sign, but apparently you need an active town meeting. <laughs> and then we've already discussed Article 1 with regards to the million dollar appropriation for the high school feasibility study. Any further questions on the warrant? Make a motion to approve Article uh, 1 through 19. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion on any of the items in here? If not, Courtney, could you call the roll, please? Selectman Gabor? Yes. Selectman Cocker? Yes. Selectman Jolba? Yes. Selectman Ford? Yes. Chairman Becker? Yes. And hopefully the Patriots play again on our, uh, <laughs> the night we have town meeting. <laughs> Makes for quick meetings. <laughs> Let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Mr. Robert with the network assessment. We have the report from Acuity Technologies. So while Greg's making his way up here, I um, want to thank Greg for all this wonderful New equipment and the still he's, working on it. We noticed the the huge server box back there and the, the screens and his microphone. So thanks for getting it all set up. Still working on it. Still work in progress. We still have some bugs to work out, but it's finally done now. Great. So um, just to give you a, a quick note, this network assessment that we have done uh, was strictly for this building, water sewer, highway, and uh, the library. So school department, school system. Uh, police department emergency services were included. We're not. They're all separate networks on their own. Um, they have limited um, work within those realms. So this is just for this, primarily this building and those other offices that connect to it. So Acuity came in and um, did an assessment because of our auditing team at one point we asked that they had just done the, the, an overall assessment of our security and, and protocols and, and how we are working now. I don't know how much time you guys have had to actually look at it yourself to see if you have any questions, but um, what I can tell you is from the time that we had it done, there's several things that have been taken care of. We didn't have anything that you would call showstoppers on our network. We did have issues that were pretty, you know, running <coughs> very quickly. Um, outside of, uh, you know, our infrastructure, our backups, which are all handled internally and now externally now, we do uh, source out a cloud service to send all of our data to this physical building, this location, which is all of our servers, all of our data. Our financial data is housed and has been housed externally for how long have we been doing this now? More than Eight 10 years? years? Or yeah, years maybe. 2008? So all of our data has been hosted through Tyler Tech on um, servers in Texas and in Maine. So Maine goes down, Texas picks up, never had an issue. We've never had to actually. Yeah. So Greg, sorry to interrupt, but uh, so what we want to avoid is a situation like Charlton had. And uh, worst case scenario, if we were hit, uh, we would be able to quickly go back to say the last night when everything was uh, saved on the cloud backup so we wouldn't lose weeks and weeks of information. In the event the cloud backup didn't get infected? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> There's and always the, that. And yeah. the likelihood of that happening because it's disconnected? It, well, we have, well, with our retention with the cloud backup, so we have seven days of retention. And after that point, we also have what they call the recycle bin, where they take another seven days and they drop it into a recycle bin in the event that any of those cloud backups do get, there's this recycle bin that's totally off their grid. They put it in a separate source. It's not attached. No one can get to it. I can't get to it. They can't even get to it until that time comes. <laughs> that was to happen, but. I mean, we have seen, obviously, most recently, New Orleans get hit prior to that. Yeah. Uh, Louisiana RMV was down for two or three days and is probably still recovering. Uh, yeah, we've even had the, mask the State Department, Department of Revenue. Yep. You know. uh, I guess it, it lends me to the question <coughs> of the disaster recovery plan. Uh, 
believe we have one. Have we tested it? How often? You know, so as far as disaster recovery plans, we don't really have a disaster recovery plan. There's nothing written down on paper of how we would manage that. I mean, I'm, I'm the IT team and also all the software support and I, uh, I wear a lot of other hats here. So as far as like processes go and things of that nature, we have not designed or developed anything on paper that would go about doing that. I mean, the way I handle anything if it was to crash or go down, I have images of all of my servers, and it's just a matter of, you know, restoring machines. It's going to take time. We may be down for several hours, but we won't lose anything. But there's there's always going to be downtime. I have a few questions um, with respect to backups. Mm -hmm. um, we do we have different retention plans based upon the type of data. So are our financials retained longer? Um, our financials you know, just are backed up nightly through. Technologies and it's I, I, I'm not 100% sure on what their retention law, uh, rules are and how they're doing it. Um, like I said, but we've never had any issues with our financial data ever going. I mean, like I said, they have redundant servers and data centers in two locations. I mean, that's data uh, data is spanned across. Would that would that financial information include billing? Yes. Um, Anything billing, tax, <coughs> um, payroll, human resource type information. That's all handled with Pilot Tech. We do not handle any of that data locally here. Okay. If anything else is Word documents, spreadsheet, email. We handle all of our email internally. Um, I, I was just going to say, going back to, to Randy's uh, comment, do we have anything in place, though, if we were to experience something, what the protocol would be to do that backup, or have we practiced or exercised that to make sure that you know, in terms of everything that we're backing up, that we haven't missed anything, that we don't have any. So I've done a bunch of upgrades just these past few months um, on our servers. We're getting ready to roll out. You know, Windows 7 is coming end of life, so I'm right now in the process of upgrading our servers and, and everything else. But as far as taking backups and just restoring data, I've had to, in the past, do that. But we've just gotten onto a new system mm -hmm. called Veeam. I don't know if you've heard of it. Pretty very well known in the industry, and we've only been live with it full time for about a month and a half. So I physically haven't even gone through myself going through a full restore back to, you know, we want to make sure everything is good and running still. And then in the event of failure, I don't have hardware that I could physically take a backup to. And so, like, you know, I can't just say, let's take this server down, let's, we'll be down for Yeah, you don't have a local backup that you machine. can use. I, I would need more hardware in order to really be able to test that kind of thing can't test in live environment. Yeah, so we have no HA locally. Yeah. Is really it. Yeah. Um, yeah. W when I looked at this, so there were a total of 33 findings. Mm -hmm. We had 11 high, 16 medium, and 6 low. Um, Do you want to go through them all one by well, one? I can tell you. I don't know if we necessarily, because yeah, what I wanted to ask and was. I would, I would caution doing that, because we do have an audit committee that probably wants to get into some detail. Some of these questions we probably don't want to hear. There are things that I don't yes. want to put say over the air. Yeah, no, I would so. agree. Um, my, my primary question was, you said that some things have already been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, can you at least just highlight, you know, which areas did we address? Were they, did they fall into the high yep. area, the medium or low? All the highs. Okay. So all of the highs? If maybe, uh, Greg, if you can just respond to the numbers on here. Yeah, let me just yep. get to my... And, and as I said, as you're looking at that, we, we did have an audit committee meeting that, that actually talked about getting um, this done as part of our meeting with the auditors, and so this report was Greg, no, this report was generated, no. um, and I think a number of these items will, you know, if we don't hear that they're resolved tonight, will end up getting discussed at the, okay. um, the audit committee meeting. Okay, so if you go by. the seventh page of the Yep. So I can tell you right off the bat. Oops, sorry about that. So number one. Um that is that let's see. is resolved, number two is resolved, number three is, 
that's still open. Number four is resolved. Number five is resolved. Number six is resolved. Number seven. So number seven is max capacity, basically. We, we need more hardware. So that's still open? Yeah, it's still open. I mean, we're fine. We just, if we want to add more, we need to make a button. Uh, eight is open. Uh, nine was inaccurate on your finding. Eleven needs to be taken care of still, but that's uh, facilities more than it is IT. Uh, Twelve is open. Thirteen is still open. Fourteen's in process, almost done. Fifteen's not necessary. So that's just staying off. 16 is not accurate. It's not complete. But what their findings is not accurate. So that's just what we're saying. Seventeen is still open. Not, not a uh, high of your finding. Eighteen is. So 19 is, it's not accurate either. There's some things on here that we need to go back and talk with them about that they, I just don't feel that they've gotten all the information correct. There's some things that we just can't do because we're not physically capable of doing it because we don't have the hardware to manage and maintain that. Uh, 20 is all set, that is fixed. 21 is fixed, 22, um, 22 is complete. That's gone. That's all set as well. 23 is still working on. 24 is, um, what is that? That should be automated. This was incorrect by their findings as well. Like this is happening and has been happening for years. So I'm not sure why they had nailed it like that. Um, 25 <coughs> is working and set. 26. 26 is being worked on, that goes through part of our infrastructure needs to be um, pretty much rebuilt, so that, that's when that will get addressed. 27 still has to be taken care of, 28 is, that's done, 29 <coughs> is done. So here, here goes to what you were saying, so we don't have any coal spares, so any time that, that I'm going, if, if we were to have a crash or if I was we have to do it live. We don't have the hardware to be able to just run up. So you don't spares. have a computer on the, in the closet? All we have, like what we have is what we have. We don't have any backup hardware in the event that a machine was to go down. I can't just take and, and send an image and, and throw it on that other server and then boom, we're back up and running. I have to literally take that server offline for however how long it's gonna take me to bring it back online, depending, which could take anywhere from a couple hours, maybe a day, maybe a week. It all depends on what the issue is. So essentially, we have primary servers with no secondary or any replication over well, yeah, we Actually, no, we have more than one server, so we have multiple DNS servers. So if one goes down, one for will DNS. pick up for DNS yeah. and IP and internet and things like yeah. that. But say the primary went down where all our data is being stored on, so just like end user files and things like that. Right. Everything will stay working, but no one can access their data. Mm -hmm. And so how long is what a downtime in that scenario? Haven't had any downtime, so I really couldn't tell. I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't had any downtime. No, in no. If that scenario was to, to, with no backup server, no redundancy. Oh, it, it really depends on the issue, right? Okay. So, I mean, but I mean, if the server, say, if it like hard crashed, yeah. it just 
yeah. completely fried, well, then we're looking at having to buy a new piece of hardware for the computer. Right, but I mean, so uh, time-wise, are you time looking wise, into three I, to I five mean, days? Or? Yeah, easily three to five days. Because okay. you think about okay. ordering, processing, getting the hardware in, I mean, we probably overnight it, you know. Uh, and the only way like would that. be to have redundant system somewhere in space. Yeah. 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 yeah, and then we're moving also virtual machines, too, so a lot of our machines oh, okay. are going to be consolidated into, you know, a bit more of a robust system where we, we are a physical service environment. We're just now moving into the virtual machine world, mm -hmm. so it's, it's slow. It's in progress, but we're getting there. Um, Should read 31 to 33, that last page. So 31 is... So 30 was a temp solution that's been resolved. 31 is work in progress, 32 is also work in progress, and 33, that's not an issue. 33 isn't even an issue, I didn't even bother to put it there. That's pretty much it. So you can see the, the majority of what they found were really, I mean, some of them were, you know, issues, but they weren't anything that was holding us back or causing us any security risks at the time. Yeah. So what I will say, you know, Greg brought me the report and uh, the same day he's like, okay, and I have done these 10 things to fix everything yeah. already. It's like, oh, <laughs> great news, Greg. So and we're just the holes. I mean, those were just small holes that I, that I had to get done because the audit came up, but there's more. That, that's not the end of it. I mean, w like I said, we're, we're literally in the process of upgrading from Windows 7, getting into the 10 environment, uh, getting everybody up to, you know, current standards with Microsoft for uh, security updates and things of that nature, but as far as our infrastructure, the network, the connectivity, the way the LAN is set up and configured, it all needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. Um, it, we're working on hardware, and as I've said this to Doug several times. Yeah, I'm he's doing it, a good job selling his new server that he's asking for. <laughs> you know, you, you, it's great having all this great new hardware, but we're working on, you know, the communication in the walls that's sending all that data is a lot of old technology and a lot of the wiring goes back, you know, 15, 20 years. And where, where, where we used to be with Cat5 was the, you know, one of the standards that we have. We're now to 6A and, and above. So we're now passing a lot of power through these, these network cables. And a lot of the stuff we have in the walls is not capable of doing that. And the more we add, the more it's going to build back up. Um, but it, it's not even something I really want to get too involved in because we could be here all night long, you know, talking about what we need versus what we want. Greg, just a sense, how, how frequently do you figure we're getting, a, a, you know, attacks, so to speak, or daily? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We get spoofed email more than anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and th that's the biggest, scariest one because, I mean, like, we get viruses every single day coming in. Right. And, and we're blocking it both on the firewall, antivirus, and on our email server. So we have three different sources of defense. Uh, but the spoofed emails, they always pass because it's just an email. But there's always typically maybe a link or something that may be hidden that we catch. And, and Doug's seen it. He had had one the other day that came through. It looked very legitimate. It was from someone that we were dealing with. And uh, the system did pick it up. It did see the attachment, remove the attachment. And when you, you yourself, as the client, tries to download that attachment, it errors out anyway because you can't. The server's already taken care of it. So I think we received a warning email that, about that particular one. Yeah, I sent that out. So it's those what I, that's what I see on a daily basis, and it, it doesn't stop. And the I system's think, as yeah, good as what we got. I think the more dangerous one is, you know, I'm not sure how, if, if we have a plan at all where we can hire a company to help train our employees better, mm -hmm. the most dangerous ones are the ones that the employees actually let get in. Yep. You know, they touch on that attachment because it looks legitimate. Absolutely. Or, you know, UPS, you have your order and you touch it, and then it affects your computer and it spreads. Have we thought of, and I know you have a huge budget of you, but you yeah. do a great job <laughs> with that budget. Have we thought of, um, you know, getting a service to help train our employees a little bit more? Um, one, do we proactively send out notes just to warn them not to touch these things or to contact you? Yeah, normally, I mean, I'm the type of person where I go office to office. It's always been my, my ground. So when I see stuff like that, I mean, if, I, if I'm nervous about it, I'll go office to office and I talk. But there are services you can get for, for not a lot of money <clears throat> that you can, um, you know, have them send on occasion to various employees just to see how they're doing and get a scorecard. And it helps train the employees um, 
you say you may want to, if we have the budget. Yeah, we can, uh, we'd know who would fail. <laughs> but, <yes. laughs> but yeah, I mean, that is a good, uh, a good suggestion. We talked with Acuity about doing some uh, support for Greg as well. We're balancing the, the, the benefit versus the cost of all those things, but um, yeah. for a short money, we may have a they may have a phishing uh, program that they can use or they've used on other clients. Yeah. Just some test sort phishing. of information security or PII yeah. related training. Yep. And those options are out there. I mean, like I said, this is this environment's only grown in the past ten years exponentially across not just here but the school systems, emergency services. Um, and it's it's you know unfortunately because of the defaults, we got a lot of specifically the schools too that really um, need some work done on the infrastructure as well as well as the town hall police department they're actually in really really good shape right now and it's one of the newer buildings so you think that when they show we put everything in there we should fit into the location but the schools this building here um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and so you know it's, it, we're gonna have to have a lot of conversations about it so. okay any further questions for Greg well, as I said, thank you for all that you do. You do a lot. Yeah, I hope, hope I was able to answer some questions. I feel like it could have been a little more technical, but I'm sure I'm sure Lisa would have been I willing was to spend a few hours a drilling more questions. But she understands a lot better. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, vote the authorization of refunding bonds in Chapter 44A application authority. We have a, a vote within our package. Yeah, so real quick, we would like to go to the state to the uh, Municipal Finance Oversight Board, uh, and they will allow us to uh, reissue these at a lower cost because we'll be able to use the state's bond rating rather than our own. It seems like kind of a no-brainer. Do you have any idea, Doug, on the estimated savings and in interest? Uh, it was $250,000 over, uh, I don't remember exactly how many years, but Several there, years. yeah. Okay. I'll entertain a motion, motion to approve. Second. Um, so we are motion and a second to approve the votes that we have received in our packages. Uh, so I'm going to refrain from, from reading them, but we all have a copy of the votes in our packages. Yes. Yeah. Right. Courtney, could you do a roll call on this one, please? Selectman Gabor? Yes. Selectman Contos? Yes. Selectman Jolder? Yes. Selectman Bork? Yes. Chairman Becker? Yes. Next item, we have vote to discharge the housing rehab program lien for 293 Thompson Road. Uh, Carol has provided us with a note on that. Doug, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just the, all the requirements have been met, so there's no reason not to release it. Okay. All right. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to second. Any discussion? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It is a unanimous vote to release these lien, this lien. Uh, next item, we have the Water and Sewer Commission update. Earl, could I maybe, can we take care of the next two items? Sure. Do mind? Sure, could no. Do you have those folks still yeah, I mean, <laughs> are we okay with that? No, okay. Sorry, Greg. We can't. Okay. Thank you. So next item, the Sydney and Rio Club transfer of license application. Uh, Bruce, you're welcome to come up, but Bruce has uh, recently purchased the what was known as the Liberty Club, so we're looking to transfer the license to that new establishment. Yes. Right, thank you. And as we normally do, we, we check with Courtney to make sure that uh, she's received all the paperwork. I did. I received the two last documents I needed today from the prior owner. So. Okay, we thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Any further questions from the board? Motion to approve. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the transfer of license application uh, to Sydney Rio from Liberty. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 It is any opposed? It is a unanimous vote. That was Thank you, Bruce. Thank we'll you. be in touch. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. To, it's very nice to be here. And, uh, Thank you. And, be, and yeah. Uh, uh, best of luck. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> interesting to listen to what happened at the TSKK. So <laughs> yeah, just don't let that be you. <laughs> And next item on the agenda, the Jocelyn House 2020 liquor license renewal. We held off on this one, uh, and I guess Attorney Sullivan's going to let us know. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We're glad you can wait the whole meeting for us. Sorry to, sorry <laughs> to keep you waiting. 
I learned a lot tonight. I learned what uh, TSKK stands for. <laughs> and I also Notice I did not try to pronounce that. I will not. I'll, when I go home, my <laughs> wife will take care of that. What can we do? So um, I don't know, if Andrew, if you want to add in. I know that there was concern with the Jocelyn House. It's been a uh, liquor license that's been carried over for several years. Um, and there was concern raised that um, nothing is happening with it. And we shouldn't really be carrying over uh, liquor licenses for so many years. And the, the question at this point is, um, is there a sale uh, in the offing? Is it being I can offered just give for you sale? A, I'll be quick because I know the board's had a very long, long evening. But um, I can go back to 2012, at which time um, the license was transferred to a, another corporation, a seller, Z. Uh, they ran a restaurant in this location for two years. Um, in 2014, in January of 2014, uh, there was a frozen pipe on the upper floor that resulted in some very serious substantial water damage in the restaurant. The restaurant went out of business. We subsequently took the license back in, a, in 2016. It took a while. I know I worked with Courtney to get through getting that license retransferred. Um, in 2017, we did take a deposit from a potential buyer. Um, that buyer was negotiating for another location in Webster. That negotiation dragged on for a significant period of time. In um, July of, two, I'm sorry, June of 2018, we entered a purchase and sale agreement with that, that buyer. In August of that year, uh, while the application was being processed at ABCC, as I recall, the buyer defaulted, and we were left with the license. Um, part of the problem has been that this location has not been completely repaired. The claim took several years to resolve. And uh, in, the, um, in the interim, uh, there was some, some renovation done. And it was sufficient to allow uh, the premises to be rented to a non-restaurant, non-alcohol um, tenant, and they are still in the premises. Since we heard from the board in early December, we are now actively marketing this license. We have entered a listing agreement with Hope Realty. We've also approached the Rose Room, and we have a backup agreement with them, as, as the board well knows, they are in the process of petitioning the legislature for a special license. If for some reason that didn't go through, or certainly if it did not go through as quickly as they would like, and our license has not been sold to a third party, we have an agreement that we would sell to them for an agreed price. That's where we're at. I have the agreements that I can show the board uh, if you'd like to see them. So just so we understand, the Hope, Hope Realty is actually Hope involved Realty. in helping to broker Local the license. On East Main Street, just the license, yes. Liquor license. Mm -hmm. it, sorry, uh, if the Rose Room were to receive theirs from the legislature, you would, again, actively market it? Well, the, the listing agreement with Hope is for a 180-day period. Okay. It would go through June. And do we, uh, a question for Doug, do we have any open liquor licenses on Main Street anymore, or have we issued our? In, in our zone, we, we do have one remaining. For that particular building, because that is within the, is that, I'm assuming, that particular building is within the zone? Right, so the, the one that we're talking about is a, is a town-wide one, but uh, we do have one still available in the Slum and Blight District. I just suggest to the board also, this particular license has a history that it was a hotel license, and that has some special characteristics that make it somewhat more Got it. popular for a, I guess we haven't had a hotel come in town yet that is uh, anxiously looking for a license. We appreciate but, the yet. Um, <laughs> frankly, uh, my clients weren't aware of the board's position uh, when I corresponded with the board back in uh, 
them, but I wrote a letter to uh, Mr. Gowerton um, and certainly if I knew that the board wanted to see some uh, marketing on the license, I would have initiated it at that time. Yeah, I think there was just, um, I'm trying to recall the conversation from Mr. Gilder. Yes, because I'm concerned about the continuing. Cor control. Correct, because it, as you had mentioned, the business was previously listed for sale, the sale fell through. And I know, I believe Courtney's gotten some feedback from the ABCC about the continual renewals with no active usage. Courtney, yeah. has the ABCC indicated they are suggesting you do not do this again? Or? They have not suggested that. Um, if there's an active building permit or if the establishment is for sale is when the board's going to make the decision. So um, but this license was an in-holders license, but when it was transferred back, it, it was a restaurant. So the, the question is, are you, so the, the, the two incidences that the ABCC allows for a license to be um, renewed when not being actively used is if there's an active building permit or the business establishment is listed for sale. So the question is, would the marketing of the all alcohol license itself meet that threshold of the business being listed for sale. Hmm. Well, is there a business associated with it at this point, or are we is there a, a building associated with it, or is it just a freestanding license? I didn't hear all what you said. Uh, so is, is this just a freestanding license, is, or is there a business associated with the license, or is there a building associated with the license? Well, there's no, there's not a building. It's a freestanding license. So it meets neither of those criteria in your Yeah, but based upon the ABCC guideline, that, that would be basically be considered a pocket license. There's no active usage. The client's not looking to sell the establishment where the previous bar was located. They're looking to market the liquor license itself for sale for anybody that would want it within the town. And obviously the liquor license is worth something of value. Um, we as a town don't have, if this were to pass and we were not able, and we did not renew it, um, we don't really have the ability to issue any more new liquor licenses other than we have the one in the uh, Blight District. Right. Correct, uh, other than going through a special act of legislation. Right. And speaking of the special act um, for the Rose Room, any time frame on that? What is a typical time frame? Uh, yeah, I mean, we submitted a ride after in November. Uh, so it was, what, three months maybe? I think that McKenna came in and said that he was going to submit it. Yeah, the, the doc, it's already listed. I checked into it the <laughs> other, other day. So it's listed on the docket, but it hasn't been taken up as a formal bill yet. If I remember right, the East and Pearl one, before we had these summer bite ones, I think it took almost a good nine months <laughs> for East and Pearl to get there. Yeah, it, I've, I know I've been following the um, special act of legislation that was requested by Waterfront Mary, so I've been following that one, and it, it does take a good six to nine months. Mm -hmm. Theirs is unfortunately taking a little bit longer because it was filed so late in the legislative session mm -hmm. for last year that it got pushed into the 2019 legislative session. And one, one um, reason I think I might be amenable to authorizing it is I was not aware of the recent, relatively recent history that, you know, as I wrote down, Attorney Sullivan, the uh, took deposit in 2017, negotiated a PNS June of 2018, and then in August of 2018, the buyer defaulted. Correct. Um, I, I guess I thought that it was just being actively, um, you know, looked to be sold. Um, but that whole time from 2014 when the water damage happened, so I didn't realize that there was actually something going on. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, mitigates a little bit of the concern that I have. Um, 
but I'm, I'm concerned too that it could take six to nine months, in which case, you know, we may very well be here um, at the end of December of 2020 having a, having a similar discussion. Yeah, I mean, it was as recently as a week or two ago that the, the Rose Room would really move forward and, and just petitioned and, and got it working with the state legislature. So. I think probably up until that point, that was the hope to sell it to them. Well, yeah. I, I just, I, I, I asked the board for cons some consideration for this particular license holder. Uh, as I suggest, they, they've gone through some hard times with this license in the last uh, number of years. Um, I, I think, I would hope that everybody can agree that these, um, this family is a well-respected family in this town. Uh, they've done a number of uh, projects throughout the years. Uh, and this license um, has been used. It hasn't been a so-called shelf license as there have been uh, some in Webster. I think there's a distinction. And I, I'd, I'd suggest that based upon that, um, my clients deserve this consideration that I'm asking and that they be allowed, that the license be renewed and they be allowed to follow through with their marketing program. And to that point, I, I would hate to lose a license, have a restaurant come up wanting to, you know, form a, a, a new restaurant in town and not have a license available to it. So that, you know, that sways me again to, you know, maybe going through and, and um, authorizing it again this year. But I think, um, you know, if we find ourselves next year in December um, in a similar situation, I, I would mm -hmm. think I would personally have a hard time um, saying yes again. Can I I would. Oh, sorry. I was going to say I'd like to see like a timeline on this marketing plan, like s establish a date by which we hope to be successful, so that you know, kind of to to Mr. Becker's point that by next year, um, that plan has been executed and we know whether or not it's been successful or not, mm -hmm. um, so that we don't revisit this. Yeah, I, I think the only concern is once you grant the license as of January first, right. it's good it's through year. December thirty first. Right. You cannot stop it. Exactly. You know, mid years. So. Correct. I I would I would make a motion that we we would um, approve it, but with the caveat that we get a follow up. Maybe someone follows up with us in three months and just lets us know the status because you have your agreements for 180 days. So rather than waiting a full six months, he just gives us a follow up in six months or three months, and then maybe another follow up in six months, just to see where we're at. Just to be fair to the board, but I would put that in the form of a motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Uh, Courtney, would you do a roll call, please, on this one? Selectman Gabor? Yes. Selectman Santos? Yes. Selectman Jolda? Yes. Selectman Bork? Yes. Chairman Becker? Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to go back to the Water Sewer Commission update. Hi. Thank you, Mike Tomorrow. Um, Greg, you want to join us? I have asked Greg to join us, and uh, Tom Andrade is a member of the uh, commission. Tom, you might as well come up too. I mean, sure. Why well, sit back there? <laughs> <laughs> and we also have, uh, not in attendance, but uh, Rick Neeser and Dan Dudo is a member of the uh, members of the commission. So we have four out of five commissioners uh, that's been appointed. Okay. So you don't have a meeting tonight. This is not a quorum. So. No. No, there's no meeting called. So um, we started back in, uh, you know, as you know, uh, the charter made provisions for a five-member water sewer commission that was passed, and uh, that commission uh, started in April of this year. I, th I believe we had our first meeting, and um, you know, learning curve and organizational, and and so on and so forth. And in the meantime. Uh, Greg assumed expanded duties, uh, so we've been working our way through, uh, you know, the learning curve and, and the maps and the lingo and, and that sort. But um, I think one of the first things we did was uh, the selectmen had a shutoff policy that I don't know was uh, ever enforced, but we revised it and um, enforced it this year. And maybe Greg, you could give a little of the numbers that that. Um uh, yes, and I 
believe May, we sent out approximately 400 letters to uh, delinquent accounts, outstanding accounts, um, for over $560,000 in delinquent payments. Um, and then a few months later, we end up whittling down that list to the, about 20 letters went out to people that owed more than $2,500. Um, and we submitted uh, registered letters to them, the shutoff notices, and reached out, made contact with them, and uh, a lot of them did pay, and some people we had to allow 90-day um, extensions, but we ultimately did re uh, recover an additional or $188,000 of that 560. Um, the collector's office did say they did notice an uptick in people paying when that, those 400 letters, very generic letters, you, your accounts are delinquent, please pay. So. Um, I would say it was a success, but it was definitely a labor intensive sending out the letters and keeping track of um, those people that, that needed more time to get their money uh, and, and their accounts and, and I, I think the hope was to, you know, uh, get the community aware that, you know, these bills go out and uh, we need the income. And, uh, I think if I remember, there were some very substantial yeah. amounts of money owed by individual or, or businesses. Correct. Very, Correct. like six figure. A lot in the ten to twenty thousand, uh, and so, yeah, uh, that that was uh, one effort. The other effort is, uh, you know, we're uh, the water uh, treatment plant is um, complete pretty much, and and integrating into the distribution system. And maybe you could just give Correct. an update. Um, uh, probably about two two and a half weeks ago, actually, the week before Thanksgiving, uh, the water department took. Um, control of the water treatment plant. The contractor still owns it and is still responsible for it, but we took over res um, the responsibility for operating it. So we operated it for that Monday and Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And then since then, we run it Monday through Friday uh, during business hours, 8 to 5. Uh, the treatment plant is only treating water from uh, what was station number 2. So we have a 650-gallon-a-minute source that's going through the treatment plant. So the treatment plant is only running at 30% capacity. So once we determined that uh, the treatment plant was functioning correctly and all the alarms and all the bugs were worked out, then station one went offline. We have five wells over at station one that needed to be rehabilitated, new pumps, new controls. So the, uh, this past Monday, station one was taken offline and those pumps were pulled. Um, and they're doing the work right now with the expectation that I believe the day after Christmas, that we're going to start pumping those wells testing those wells and then running the, that water through the new treatment plant. So the expectation is the contractor said they will have substantial completion by uh, January 15th. So we are very close to having a um, treatment plant that can provide water for the entire town uh, with extra capacity, including Station 3 is still in reserve as well. So that, that means only one-third of it going through now, but it'll be at full capacity correct, at that point? Correct, correct. Uh, right after Christmas, we will bring those other five wells through the treatment plant, and that's going to be a learning curve as well, both with from the vendors and the contractor and from the water department staff, how does the plant operate at 1,600 gallons a minute versus 600 gallons a minute. And that's not a question of if you have five, bring one, one of the five at a time, because you said they're pooled? So yeah, they're, they all, they're all manifolded months. together, so we are actually have uh, the ability to pump all six wells at the same time, and that's probably the way we will operate it. But we do have the flexibility to run three and leave three offline or run four and two, so that's all built into the controls. And, um, you know, obviously I think we're all aware that the water treatment plant is one part of the, the problem that we have, uh, and the infrastructure uh, repair and replacement i.e., you know, we've done flushing, ice digging. Uh, we've relined a uh, section of Myrtle Ave this year, uh, and that's gone well, and I think without too much incident, temporary lines were installed, um, and the project took five or six weeks, I believe, or maybe Yeah, that, that was uh, done at about start to finish about three months. Yeah. But it, it, went, it went well. It, it was a more of a... Uh, demonstration for us to, to learn about the technology. Um, it, we b essentially cleaned and lined the interior of that pipe. We didn't do any open trench work. Um, it has its applications, um, and we it, it was successful. I, I think um, I, I was happy with it, but it, we expect we encountered some difficulties that we hadn't anticipated. 
So that will, we will use that going forward when, um, for future infrastructure decisions. And, and for, uh, for Greg, do we have in the next couple of streets already identified for doing this again for the next go-round where we've, I assume, we have, had some problems? We have the same, the same capital um, improvement plan that I spoke about a year or two ago, and we do have a number of higher priority streets that we can tackle. Um, we also have a, a connection down Worcester Road and Old Worcester Road that would help with fire flow. So we do have a, a bunch of projects that we can do. We haven't um, narrowed it down to which ones we are going to do next. Uh, we're going to probably spend the next uh, six months coming up with that plan, making and getting our funding, uh, re certified retained earnings, and, and our capital investment plan for the, the next big cycle of, of either relining or combination of relining and um, improvement. It would be nice to know, I think, if, if any of the selectmen could get a, uh, a copy of how the number of complaints updated have been coming down for the past couple of years, if we can get a monthly or quarterly, just to get an idea of. I believe I generated a graph for that uh, a year or so ago, and I can just add on to that. It, it has dropped off. It absolutely has. Yeah, if we didn't ever flush, we'd never get complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, the complaints still do show up on, on Facebook on and, Tuesday. Yeah. And just to realize that, you know, th there's a, a timeline for the engineering of any section of road that we do and a cost associating with that. And then, you know, once that plan, there's the actual work of the relining. So it's kind of a two-stage, you know, you plan, you pay the money, you, you get the design, you get the funds, you replace or reline the pipes. So it, it's kind of, that's how it goes. Uh, situation. So what we've been looking to do is, you know, our source of income is an enterprise as we charge for the service that we provide. In this case, uh, uh, it's water. Um, and that's our source of, of income. Um, we've been looking at other possible uh, potential for income for the, uh, the enterprise fund. One of the things that we explored, and I think it w I presented a while ago, was charging, uh, which a lot of towns do, charge the municipal government and the schools for the water usage. Uh, I think we presented a graph at one time. And- uh, For clarification, schools do pay. Right, I'm Correct. getting to that. <laughs> so we since found out that the school is paying for their portion. If you recall, uh, the school was a, a, a bigger uh, portion of the total water and sewer usage uh, compared to the town. Uh, but we did refine, we worked through that. I, I think Greg has three sets of uh, data that he has to look at for the meters and so on and so forth. Um, so we've come down to, uh, for this, this year, um, that the water use and the sewer um, by the town, and that includes that list that I uh, had provided, I think, several months ago uh, for the town metered buildings. Uh, and that comes down to uh, $18,800 8, $18, for water and $9,200 for sewer. Combined, that's about a $28,000 annual um, fees. Um, we've, we've also looked at other times, it seems like, you know, it's all over the place, but it's a reasonable thing to do in today's world is, you know, it's, a, it's water is a commodity, you pay for your, uh, you know, like you do gas and electricity and oil and fuel. Uh, and we think it's, it's, we'd like to see it absorbed and the, the selectmen uh, agree that, that that be incorporated into the budget as an offset to what the enterprise pays for services that <laughs> the town provides. Um, it's a small amount, but it roughly represents almost 1%. And over time, that's, you know, 1% uh, of revenue contribution. The second request uh, that we'd like to present to the town for agreement is the property on Tower Road um, by the water tower, that strip that goes down to Thompson Road. So as you're looking from Thompson Road with the lake to your back, you look at the water tower, that strip of water. That strip of 
trees and yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, there's no use for that, and um, we'd like to have the board consider um, separating the property. I, I don't know if I can see, but it, it's kind of a, a small seven. This is the water tower up here. Maybe turn it on yeah. to the camera. Maybe yeah. may help. We can yeah. show, we'll bring it up at our yes. next meeting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I didn't bring my computer. I bring it up on the screen. Yeah. But anyway, um, we're looking at the possibility of separating this and retain and rezoning uh, this and uh, selling that property so that uh, it could be used for building, uh, rezone to uh, either residential or residential. Into the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if we were to do that, and that requires a town meeting vote, um, and we're actually doing the research, we found out that uh, the town purchased that property well before the Water Sewer Enterprise Fund was created. So. Uh, the Board of Select wouldn't have to determine where those funds were to go. Um, sorry, actually, it would be town meeting because they um, or became a receipt reserved for appropriation, and then town meeting has to make that appropriation. So, th so Doug, the question would be how much of that would go towards the water sewer fund and how much would go to the general fund? Right. Well, it, yeah, and essentially town meeting gets to decide how much. And, and there's also the balance of what's the value of the open space versus the value of um, uh, selling off the property. Has, uh, Earl or Greg, has anyone looked at that with regards to where the pipe comes down from the tower and it's not going down the middle of the property, is it going so down the, the road? The water mains themselves are in the road. There is a overflow drain that kind of cuts the upper portion of uh, like maybe 60, 70 feet into the, the property that they were looking at um, dividing. But it's a, it's a drain versus uh, a water main. So if if there was too much flow going into the tower, it's an overflow. Correct. A relief valve of sorts. Correct. And th that could be that could be um, redirected. Yeah, and these are these are items I think Earl, if if the Water Sewer Commission wants to bring forth, we can certainly bring them up as an agenda item. Um, you know, here we probably shouldn't discuss them because they're not an agenda item, either the sale of the property or the or the um, charging the town. Mm -hmm. uh, the water sewer use fees. No, it's it's more just a, a con, you know, conceptual idea. Uh, and and uh, while we're on that subject, uh, you know, th there's the uh, the property that I believe is the water department's property where they on the Gore Road where they did attempt to uh, drop some wells years ago by the by sports. The yeah, one. yeah, yeah. So uh, that would be the property uh, with your back to the lake, looking at the fish and game. Exactly. On, on yep. Yeah. On this side yeah. of the uh, creek. So all of that is to looking, you know, towards revenue, um, wherever we can get revenue to to do the uh, project that needs to get done. Um, you know, we have water rates that, that we have to consider. Uh, we have the town that we have to consider, and, and you know, as as we all do. Uh, but we have to do it, and we have to raise funds really to. Uh, make any reasonable effort uh, to address this uh, problem. That's really. And the same applies on the sewer side as well. There's capital investments that are needed for on the sewer side, but um, the sewer doesn't own the, the land and that we're speaking of. And I think that the plans that we were presented with a year or so ago had multiple years worth of capital uh, projected capital expenditures to start taking care of some of the, uh, you know, lines that were more in trouble. Right. Uh, correct. Correct. Right. The, the plan. The plan generally is every other year we would do a capital investment. So um, do a project, have a year off to recuperate our funds, do the engineering for it, and then do field work every other year or maybe every third year. So that plan is still in, is, in place. Is really elongated, uh, and, and, and we're trying to condense that somewhat um, and, and without just making ridiculous water rates. And it, it would be ideal to, to be able to do an engineering plan for one section and in that same year accomplish a section of replacement. Um, and, and instead of, you know, one year study, next year replace and so on and so forth. 
And mm -hmm. to go to your question on the sewer is the INI project and the certain mandates uh, that, that's coming down the road for the for the sewer uh, component for the town systems that, that uh, are going to have to be uh, dealt with also uh, financially. And so that's really kind of for you. If you have any extra questions for Greg or I. Any further um, questions from the board? Appreciate the update, Greg. Earl. Tom, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, moving on, we have um, any old business? I don't believe we have any no. old business to talk about. Do you want to just take care of that consent item? Yeah. And then we can uh, do, Doug, Doug, do your report. And we do have the um, agreement with yeah. the consent yeah. item. Has, does anyone have any questions on it? So this would be the uh, Town of Webster Redevelopment Authority and Community Opportunities Group, Inc. <coughs> Agreement. Doug, I'm assuming you and Carol have gone through this. Yeah, so it's a, a the standard contract we have them, so I, I have no concern with us approving it and uh, continuing to work with them. They've been very successful in helping the town move forward with the, the French River Park and the French River Walk. Okay. Any questions from the board? The only one I had was, what is technically phase five? I think it referred to phase five. Yeah, so uh, we've been... Uh, Initially, we were going to work behind the, where it ends at the police station and go over to is that Peter Street, uh, next to, Pete's yeah. Garage. Yep. Yeah, so uh, there's maybe some difficulties with getting the correct, all the easements worked through that. So we may be working on Davis Street from uh, where the project that was just finished up to the Main Street. We might be focusing on that instead. Along Davis Street. Yeah. And I guess the only other question I would have is: is if there, if th could this money be used elsewhere, which would make more sense to be used elsewhere? Right? And is this the only project? And is this the one that, because we've gone yeah, through I four mean, phases, we just want to get this finished up? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what the plan has been when the it was developed several years ago, is to you know, split this French River Walk into five different phases. Uh, it can be used it, for other purposes. It could even be used, say, for relining water mains in certain areas of town. But uh, the Community Development Office has held public hearings, and uh, after holding those public hearings, this was the project that they recommend moving forward and that there was a consensus on. Okay. Any further questions from the board? If not, we'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the contract between the Town of Webster and the Community Opportunities Group Inc. for Grant Advisory Services. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Okay, Doug, we'll um, jump yeah, into the I'll do this report. quickly so we can let Daniel go home. <laughs> <laughs> so, I. Uh, as you know, the holidays are coming up, so I have on here listed the uh, holiday hours for Town Hall and the library and the Senior Center. Um, pretty standard, except we do leave on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. It will close at noon. Uh, that's what it's always been. Uh, we go to public health and safety. Uh, I'd just like to uh, give a shout out to Carol. We had lots of events the last few weeks, the Winter Wonderland and the tree lighting ceremony. We had over 200 people here on Saturday evening. Uh, it was a great turnout. Uh, there's still lots of cookies left if you want one. Uh, under finances, uh, we submitted the FY20 tax recap. It was one of the earliest and smoothest tax uh, setting processes we've ever had in town. Um, we also talked about the uh, going to the MFOB to save the $250,000. Uh, under economic development, uh, we were approved by the uh, Economic Assistance Coordinating Council to uh, begin our vacant storefront program that will give $10,000 in incentives to storefronts on uh, Main Street. Uh, also, the Samuel Slater Museum uh, invited the selectmen. We had a few that were able to make it out, and they are making actually surprisingly good progress, and they hope to open in summer 2020, and uh, it will be certainly a destination for 
uh, the region. Uh, infrastructure, Greg, update us on the water filtration plant. Uh, item number C, we received proposals for the uh, Memorial Beach design, so Carol and I will read through that and uh, make sure that we get a good contractor. Uh, we have uh, under five, the effective delivery of services. I sent out an email this afternoon to the selectmen with what is all the policies that I am aware of, if the board doesn't mind just double checking if there's a policy that you know of that wasn't in there, please let me know. Uh, I will make suggestions for edits at our next meeting, maybe not the January meeting, but maybe the February one because we won't be uh, meeting very long. Uh, uh, under, I'd Doug, I'm sorry, on that, um, you know, perhaps you could also provide some recommendations for how long we should tickle them for the future. <clears throat> some policies we, we may want to review every year. Yeah. some every three, some every five, so that we can have a, a constant flow uh, that we know of. Yeah, well, we could even build that into the document. Yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, number six here, the select one office hours. Uh, I believe Randy has volunteered to be here next Monday if anyone wants to argue with him. This will be <laughs> nope, okay. No tickets. Uh, <laughs> Also, we have, I mentioned this before, uh, with our committee opening, so we have, I sent also a draft out for a committee handbook, so if you have any feedback on that, we will cover that as well when we cover the, all the other policies. Uh, and we have, uh, we'll advertise for that on Facebook and also in the newspaper, so it's gonna run constantly every month, uh, the first uh, uh, publication of the month that will be in there. Uh, item C there, this is our next six meetings. Uh, we will be meeting typically on the second Monday of the month. Those are all the second Mondays. Uh, we lucked out, none of those are actually Monday holidays, so we should be able to be consistent with those over the next six months, so please plan on those. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, planning and conservation will also be using this room on Monday evening so that they will be recorded and available for people to watch. I think the goal there was just more transparency yeah. so that we can get them all out there and people can rewind them and see them if they're not able to come in, in person. <coughs> Motion to accept. Second. Any further questions for Doug? All those in favor of accepting the town administrator's report, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, last item on our agenda is executive session. We do plan to go into executive session.